for the Bible study. And let's see, are you ready? I'm ready. Well, let's pray. Okay. Pray already? Well, there's probably nobody going to be here. We're half hour early. Okay. Let's pray. Everybody knows my pretty lady. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to do Bible study. We ask, oh, blessed Heavenly Father, for the forgiveness of sins, for the blessings of your presence, and that you would give us of your spirit in a double, triple, quadruple portion, that you would help us to understand what your word has to say about the subject of the second angel's message. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, Mom. Mom's here. Mom's here. So last time we talked about, we talked about the first angel's message. Yes. Yes, and the, how the everlasting gospel yes. was the spirit of Christ yes. given to all creation, both the obedient creatures and the disobedient creatures. Yes. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believe on him should not have, uh, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Yes. So, the everlasting good news is the Son of God which taketh away the sins of the world. So we talked about the spirit of Christ is the spirit of submission. It's the spirit of obedience. It's the spirit of loving and trusting the Heavenly Father. We saw that the first angel's message was that the literal Son of God brings that spirit of submission, obedience, and trust to all creation, that the Son of God died for lost man, restoring sinful human back into the image of God, back into the image of Christ, and that we saw that the Trinity was a counterfeit for that, and that the first angel's message, if you're a Trinitarian, is a counterfeit three angels' message. Today we're going to look at the wine of Babylon, its origins, and its results. So, we are going to start with Genesis chapter 11, verse 4. Genesis chapter 11, verse 4. And this is what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 11, verse 4. And they said, Go, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Babylon, Babel. The Tower of Babel. This is where Babylon has its origin in the King Nimrod and at the city of Babel, the portal to God. And they were seeking to build a tower that would reach unto heaven because they didn't believe God's word that said that he would never flood the earth again. They were rebelling against the fact that God said spread out through the whole world and be fruitful and multiply. They wanted to keep mankind centralized in a specific location. And this idea of reaching heaven on their own strength was confusion, rebellion, apostasy. We know that Babylon means rebellion, unbelief, confusion, and apostasy. Wine in the Bible stands for doctrine. 1 Corinthians 11.25 1 Corinthians 11.25 says, After the same matter also he took the cup that had the wine in it. And when he had supped, he said, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So this cup of wine represents the New Testament. This represents the teachings, the doctrines that the New Testament has. So wine represents doctrine. So the wine of Babylon represents the doctrine of rebellion, confusion, apostasy, unbelief. It is very important that is the world in a place where, specifically the Christian world, where the wine of Babylon, the doctrine of confusion, rebellion, disbelief, and apostasy, is the world in this place? And we can clearly say yes. The entire world is in a place where rebellion, disbelief, apostasy, and confusion runs rampant, right? Evolution in the Christian world. A belief that it was millions of years, not a, a, a young earth. Uh, uh, the Christian world, barely hardly anybody believes in the flood. They think, oh, it was just a local flood and it's not necessarily 
a, a story that is uh, biblically true, right? Uh, that stands for unbelief. They don't believe the, what the, the, the young earth creation story. There's rebellion in the Christian world, right? They say that God's law has been done away with, right? The very principles that govern God's kingdom, they don't matter. You know, imagine driving down the street, being pulled over by a police officer and saying, I'm sorry, police officer, but your rules don't govern my life. I, you don't have a right to ticket me. Impossible. Impossible. God's governing principles matter. Just even a thousand times more than earth's governing principles. Confusion, apostasy, idolatry, perversion is in the Christian world today, right now. And you, and so we see, can see those things in the secular society, but in Christianity, idolatry, rebellion against the law of God, unbelief of the biblical chronology, right? Apostasy, confusion, idolatry, perversion in Christianity, allowed in Christianity, all kinds of it too, right? People are blinded to the understanding of scripture, right? People are blinded and confused in their understanding of prophecy, unable to discern that we live in the very end of time, the time that Christ warned us to be ready for. The, the entire Christian world is blind to the fact of where we are. So the wine of Babylon is everywhere. We're neck deep in the wine of Babylon and in every institution, whether it's religious or not religious, it, it doesn't matter. The wine of Babylon is prevalent, right? If the institution itself teaches unbelief, rebellion, confusion, apostasy, that institution teaches the wine of Babylon. It doesn't have to be religious, right? That institution teaches unbelief, rebellion, apostasy, and confusion. That institution is part of Babylon. It doesn't matter if it's religious or not. And what we're going to do is we're going to look and see, where does the wine of Babylon have its origins? How did it go through the process of becoming a worldwide uh, uh, fixture? And how is it do I, as an individual, let go of the wine of Babylon? So we're going to, let's look at Christ, right? Let's see what Christ has to say about scripture, because we're going to see that what Christ says about scripture is the foundation of coming out of Babylon, because the wine of Babylon is actually anything that goes against scripture. So let's see what Jesus had to say about scripture. John 5, 39. John chapter 5, verse 39 says this. John 5, 39. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So all scripture refers to Christ. Luke 24, Luke 22, 44. Luke 22, 44 says this. Luke 24, 44. Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. This is very important to understand the perimeters of what Christ calls scripture, the word of God. He said, that's the law of Moses, that's the prophets, and that's the Psalms, right? He said, these things concern me. He didn't go outside and reach outside of the law of Moses or the prophets or the Psalms. He said that these law of prophets, uh, the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms, this is the scripture. So when we go outside of these things to understand and learn about the character of God or his uh, uh, parameters of what a human being should do, we need to be very, very careful that if anything outside of the scriptures doesn't line up with scripture, that is a source of the wine of Babylon. So scripture is the word of God, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And the New Testament simply confirms these things as being true. So the New Testament can be 
included in that as well. So the wine of Babylon is a doctrine of unbelief. It's a doctrine of rebellion. It's a doctrine of apostasy. And it all starts in the, in the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Here we go. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Very important. This is the seed of the wine of Babylon, right? Disobedience, rebellion, changing God's word, doubting God's word. That's what the wine of Babylon does, right? The wine of Babylon originates with Satan, which changes God's word, bringing in doubt and a desire for something forbidden, right? This develops a character of rebellion and unbelief. That's what happened here. A character entered into humanity of unbelief in God's word, and it was a rebellion against God's command. This character trait entered into humankind right here. Genesis chapter 3, verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I have commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman which you gave me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I did eat Adam. The leader, very important, that Adam was responsible for the protection of his family, right? Adam could neither deny nor excuse his sin. But instead of repenting, instead of admitting what he did was wrong, Adam allowed pride to blame. Adam allowed the pride in his heart to become prominent and he blamed others. He blamed his wife, and he blamed God, right? Eve was deceived, but Adam chose sin. There's a difference between being tricked and choosing sin. Adam's sin was greater than Eve's. And what do we see? We see Adam, the leader, deliberately choosing disobedience, rebellion, and as a natural result of choosing disobedience and rebellion, he was afraid, right? I, I, I hid because I was scared. And what was the next thing that we see? We see pride, Adam refusing to acknowledge his sin, but blames it on other people. So this seed of rebellion, this seed of disbelief, its fruit begins to take place as fear and as pride. And at this point, two paths of humanity begin to develop. That sounds funny, that at this point, two paths of humanity begin to develop. But we see it right here, Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. And upon your belly you shall go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. And I will put hostility between you and the woman, between thy seed and between her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. 
the seed of the woman, those who follow God, the seed of the serpent, those who follow Satan, right? The seed of the woman represents obedience. The seed of the woman represents trust. It represents love. It represents submission. Christ is the fulfillment and the personification of Genesis 3.15. Christ is the seed of the woman. But so is anybody who loves and trusts and submits to the word of God. Anybody who believes God is the seed of the woman, right? The seed of the serpent, disbelief, rebellion, fear, pride, selfishness. This is the wine of Babylon developing and its ultimate fulfillment is going to be in the man of sin and the children of Satan. That's where its ultimate fulfillment and the personification of the seed of the serpent is going to be in the wine of Babylon and the man of sin and the children of Satan. Right, The wine of Babylon and the man of sin, the seed of the serpent, the seed of the woman, those who are obedient to God, two paths. Humanity now begins on a path of two different paths, one for the obedient and one for the disobedient. The seed of the woman, the sons of God, right? This is the wheat that the, uh, Matthew talks about. The sons of, or the seed of the uh, serpent is the sons of men. These are the tares, right? These are not angels mixing with human beings. This is those who are obedient to the word of God and those who are disobedient to the word of God. The humanity takes two paths here, one who's going to follow God and one who's not going to follow God. And we see the final results of this in Matthew 13, 24. Matthew 13, 24. Two paths that have its final end. Matthew 13, 24. And another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. So we see a sower of good seed and a sower of bad seed. We see the children of God and we see the children of Satan. But when the blade sprung up and brought forth the fruit, then appeared the tares also with the wheat. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? From when then has the tares come? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Will thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, No, least while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Two paths of humanity, which started back in Eden, Genesis chapter 3, 15, the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent, has its ultimate fulfillment in the wheat and the tares, the seed that is sown by the enemy, the seed that is sown by God. It's going to be fulfilled someday. These two paths are seen again in Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Here we go. So Adam... When he chose to sin against God, the character that he took upon himself was no longer the character of God. It was a character of rebellion, disobedience, fear, and pride. Let's see what happens as Adam passes this character to his children. Genesis chapter 4. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect. And Cain was angry and his appearance fell. 
And the Lord said unto Cain, Why are you angered? And why is your countenance fallen? And if you do well, shall you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And unto you shall be the desire, and you shall rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Adam now has the character of rebellion, of unbelief, of fear and pride. And Adam passes the seed of disobedience to his children, right? And Abel, right, the one who trusted in the blood of the Lamb, he embraces submission to God's word. He embraces obedience to the requirements that God says, this is the forgiveness of sin, the Lamb of God. Abel embraces submission, obedience, and loving trust in the Father. Cain does not. Cain brings the works of his own hands. Cain embraces rebellion, unbelief, fear, pride, and then adds to that resistance, anger, hatred, and murder. The, the, the character of human beings is going downhill very quickly, all because of the seed of unbelief and rebellion. Very important that the character of humanity is taking shape and that the wine of Babylon is being developed through the course of human history. Right? This is developing the seed of Satan into its full intention. Right, The destruction of the obedient children of God. Right, Cain killed Abel because of his obedience. Satan wanted to destroy the Son of God because he was jealous of his position, which he held with the Father. Cain is cursed because of his rebellion, his disobedience, his apostasy, his confusion, his fear, his pride, his resistance. He's cursed, right? But it's not a curse that something um, is an unnatural thing. This is a natural result of choosing unbelief, rebellion, pride, resistance, anger, and hatred. The blessings that come from God, they come through the Spirit of Christ. We saw that, that the loving, trusting, submissive, obedient Spirit of Christ has blessings with it. And when we reject the Spirit of Christ, when we reject obedience, when we reject, when we reject submission, when we reject the Spirit of Christ, there's only one thing left, the Spirit of Satan. That does not come with blessings. That comes with hatred and anger and rebellion and unbelief. And the curse is left. A fugitive, a vagabond, a wanderer came searching for a sense of fulfillment, but he can't find it because their true fulfillment is only when we are living the purpose of Christ, when we have the Spirit of Christ. So when we don't have the Spirit of Christ, we are searching for fulfillment in every way. But that's, true fulfillment is only found when we have the Spirit of Christ in us. Genesis chapter 4.25. Genesis chapter 4.25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel who came slew. Seth is born. This is very important because Seth, again, embraces the spirit of Christ. Seth embraces submission and obedience to God. Seth embraces the loving spirit of Christ. Seth becomes the leader of the tribe of the sons of God. Those people who who are obedient to God, then get the name sons of God. Cain becomes the leader of the sons of men. That's the tribe that Cain leads. That's the name of the tribe, the sons of men. So the two paths of humanity, those obedient to God and those disobedient to God, each have a leader. Seth leads the son of God. Cain leads the sons of men. This is what takes place. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, 
and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, the children of Seth, saw the daughters of men, the children of Cain, that they were fair, and took them wives of all which they had chosen. This is very, very, very important, right? The sons of God, the sons of Seth, looked upon the daughters of Cain and could not discern their character. And they fell in love with them, right? The spirit of pride, the spirit of rebellion, the spirit of unbelief, of anger, of hatred was in the beautiful daughters of Cain. And what happened when they married and had children with the daughters of Cain? When the sons of God, the children of Seth, not angels, what happened when the sons of God, the children of Seth, married and had children with the sons of men, the sons of Cain? They took upon themselves women that had pride and anger and hatred and unbelief and rebellion issues. And as a result, these beautiful women of Cain, but ugly on the inside, are now raising the children of God. And that unbelief, that anger, that hatred, that rebellion that's in the daughters of men is being transferred to the sons of God as they're raising the children they bear. This is very important. Transferring the character of rebellion, disbelief, hatred, anger, murder, bitterness, resistance is going into the children of God. Genesis chapter 6 verse 4. Genesis chapter 6 verse 4. There were giants in the earth that in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bare them children the same were mighty men, which were of old. Men of renown. This is very important. Giants. This word giant points to large egos. It points to tyrants. It points to men seeking power. We use the same wording today. He's a giant in this industry. He's a giant in this field. Giant. Men seeking power. Men who have large egos. Yes, there were literal giants in those days. You look at the fossil record, everything was uh, twice as big before the flood. But this word giant is, is not talking about angels mixing with humans. It's not talking about that. It's talking about men with big egos seeking to obtain power. Very important. This is not humans and angels having children. This is the mixing of God's people, the tribe of Seth, mixing with the sons of men, the tribe of Cain, the mixing of obedient with the disobedient. And as a result, tyrants are born who are seeking to rule over God's people. Very important. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of his thought was only evil continually. Through this mixing of the sons of God and the daughters of men, that rebellious, disobedient, hateful, angry, resistant spirit was now being transferred and mingled throughout all of humanity. And as a result, the spirit of Christ of submission and obedience, of loving trust to the Father, could no longer be found in mankind. Could no longer found, be found in mankind. This is why the, the natural result was that the world was judged. Because there was no longer the Spirit of Christ in the people that God had created because of the, of the mixing of the obedient with the disobedient. This is, has nothing to do with mixing of the genes with humans and angels. That's not even possible. We'll see that in a minute. This has to do with a mixing of the descendants of Seth with the descendants of Cain. And when the two mixed, the rebellious, the disbelief, the, the resistance, the hate, the anger, overwhelmed humanity as a whole so that humanity as a whole could no longer carry 
the spirit of Christ. Genesis 6, 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Very important that Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Noah was still somebody that was able to hold on to the spirit of Christ. Submission, obedience, and loving trust to the Father. What happens? The flood comes. Everything changes, right? And now Noah, who is the leader of the sons of God, that's what Noah is the leader of the sons of God. He is the leader of the seed of the woman. He's the leader of the obedient people of God. He begins to replenish the earth. Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, 17. Genesis 9, 17. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all the flesh that is on the earth. And the sons of Noah that went forth out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. Let's remember that Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah. And of them was the whole earth overspread. So the three sons of Noah are the ones who are the original seed makers of all of humanity that's on the planet now. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunk, and he was uncovered within the tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren. And when Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward and uncovered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem and Canaan, shall be his servants. And God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem and Canaan shall be his servant. This is very important. Ham does something unspeakable. We don't know what it is. All we know is that it's so bad, the Bible doesn't even mention it. Whatever it was, it was unspeakable. Ham is the one who did the problem, right? Ham carries the characteristics of the wickedness that was in the old world, and he violates his father, whatever, I don't know what it was. But the Bible says it's Canaan, his son. Ham had a son, Canaan. And it's Canaan who receives the curse. Now, why would the son receive the curse for what his father did? This is very important. Canaan, the son, receives the curse not because he did something wrong, but because he's the son of Ham. So, Canaan is going to receive the character of the father. And that's where the curse comes in. It's not a curse that he did something wrong. It's a curse because he's going to carry on the characteristics of rebellion, of hatred, of perversion. A wicked, perverse, rebellious, resistant, prideful character. This will pass on to Canaan and then that will pass on to Canaan's children. That's the curse. It's not a curse because he did something wrong. It's a curse because of the character he is about to carry into all of humanity. Right? Genesis chapter 10, verses 6. Genesis chapter 10, verse 6. And the sons of Ham. Very important now. And the sons of Ham was Cush, Mizoram, and Put, and Canaan. And the sons of Cush was Sheba, Hevliah, Shabta, Ramha, Sabcheka, and the sons of Ramna were Sheba and Adan. And Cush begat Nimrod. And Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. This is very important, right? That Ham begat Canaan. Canaan begat Cush. And Cush begat Nimrod, right? Ham, with his wicked character, passed his wicked character down to Canaan. 
Canaan took the wicked character of Ham and passed that wicked character down to his son Cush. Cush took that wicked character and gave it to Nimrod, the mighty one in the earth. This is very important because Nimrod, Nimrod is the king of Babylon. Nimrod is the very first king in the Bible. And there is nowhere in the Bible that says that Nimrod attribute, attributes his kingdom to God. It says something that Nimrod is the one who establishes. So Nimrod's kingdom is in rebellion against God. Right? Nimrod is the leader of the seed of the serpent. He's the leader of the sons of men. Nimrod, the mighty one. This word mighty means tyrant. Same as it was with the giants. It's the same, right? And Nimrod, the rebellious king, he's the first king of Babylon. He doesn't acknowledge God. And what happens? Nimrod, the king of Babylon, carries the character of rebellion, of unbelief, of pride, of hatred, of anger, of confusion, of resistance, of apostasy. And he develops a nation that reaches throughout the whole world. And he, he develops a religion that reaches through the whole world. And as this nation, as this religion is spread out through the whole world, what is spread with it? Rebellion, disbelief, apostasy, confusion, tyranny, resistance, hatred, anger, murder is spread through the whole world, right? And the Bible says that this Babylonian belief system, whether in a nation or in a religion, is going to last until the second coming. That's what the second angel's message says. It says that Babylon has fallen, has fallen, because she had made all nations drink of the wrath of her wine, of her fornication. She's drinking of the false doctrines of apostasy, which lead to disbelief which lead to rebellion, which lead to anger and hatred and bitterness and apostasy. We see the seed that started with the tree of the garden of uh, good and evil being brought into humanity, disbelief and rebellion through generation after generation, after generation gets worse and worse fear and pride and resistance and hatred and anger and perversion and murder is given and gets worse and worse and worse through each generation. And it's finally carried into a new system called Babylon, which institutes a new form of government and institutes a new form of religion, which goes throughout the whole world, changing the character of all humanity. It's very important that this will last until the second coming. And there's a very ironic twist to this story, that Babylon had a very specific concept for worship, right? The, the Babylonian concept for worship revolved around three beings, right, which were united in a mystery. And the identities, the identity of these three beings were blurred into one person. That's very important. That Babylon's concept of worship had to do with three beings, a mystery in the unity. And these beings were blurred into a one being. This is the Trinity. This is where the Trinity comes from. And this is exactly what we see in Christianity today. Modern Christianity teaches a Trinity, right? Three beings mysteriously united which are blurred into one being, which we can't actually understand, right? But the Bible says that we can understand God and that if we ask God, he will reveal himself to us and that this is what humanity should glory in and the fact that we know and understand God. Jeremiah chapter 9, 23. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 says this, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. 
But let him that glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord which exercises loving kindness, judgment, righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. This is how we know if we are the sons of men, if we know God and we embrace the character of God. If we are not having a personal relationship, getting to know God and developing the character of Christ, we absolutely are in rebellion, in disbelief, developing the character of Babylon, drinking the wine of Babylon. Isaiah 44, 6. Who is God? Isaiah 44, 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. This is a reference to the Father and to the Son. God says, if you want to glory in anything, don't let it be in wisdom, don't let it might be in might, don't let it be in riches. Glory in the fact that you know me. And Isaiah 44 says 6. Isaiah 44, 6 says that the Lord God, the Father, and his Redeemer. That's the Son of God which taketh away the sins of the world. John 17, 3. John 17, 3. And this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent, glorifying in knowing the God, the Lord, and his Redeemer. And this is eternal life. Knowing the Lord, the Father, and the Son, the Redeemer of Israel, is very important. This is the basis for coming out of Babylon, getting to know God, the true God, the one true God, getting to understand him and his Son, because this is the basis for eternal life. The wine of Babylon steals us away from getting to know the one true God his son, and the character that they give us through the Spirit, which leads to eternal life. The wine of Babylon gives us a false god. It leads us down false doctrine, which causes us to develop a false character. If we want to get to know the one true God, we need to ask for pure doctrine. Deuteronomy 32.2 Deuteronomy 32.2. This is what it says. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the shower upon the grass. God compares his doctrine to rain. And he says, My speech shall distill as the dew, and my doctrine shall drop as the rain. Pure doctrine, like rain, water, refreshing us. Zechariah 10.1. Zechariah chapter 10, verse 1. Zechariah chapter 10, verse 1. Ask ye the Lord rain. Ask ye the Lord pure doctrine. Ask ye the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain so that the Lord shall make bright clouds and give to them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. Do we want to get to know God and his only begotten Son, which is eternal life? Then we need to ask for the rain. We need to ask for the pure doctrine. We need to stop drinking the wine of Babylon, and we need to start asking God for the pure doctrine. Ask ye rain. Ask ye pure doctrine. In the time of the latter rain. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 1. This is what it says. They say, If a man put away his wife, and she go unto him, and become another man, shall he, sh he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. Yet return again unto me, saith the Lord, very important to understand that prostitution is a symbol of apostasy and rebellion against God. And Babylon 
takes the form or prophetic symbol of a prostitute. So, wine of Babylon is apostate doctrine. Right? And here we're talking about people in apostasy, people who have played the harlot. And it says this, Lift up your eyes unto the high places, and see, thou has not been lying with in the ways that you have said unto them, as the Arabian in the wilderness. And you have polluted the land with your prostitution and wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withheld from you, and there hath been no latter rain, and you has a prostitute's forehead, and you refuse to be ashamed. This is very important. The rain represents God's pure doctrine. This is how we get to know the Father and the Son. God says, ask of the rain, and I will give it to you. But he also says, you don't receive the rain because you refuse to stop thinking like a prostitute. You refuse to stop thinking in apostasy. So if we're holding on to apostasy, how can we obtain God's pure doctrine? If my hands are filled and I have no more room, if I'm refusing to let this go, how can I grab something else? I can't do it. I have to let go of the apostasy first. I have to be willing to examine myself to see if I am in the faith. I have to be willing to put the time and invest in what the Bible says. Not just a five-minute video on YouTube. But I have to actually get my hands dirty, get my mind in the Word, and investigate. Ask God for the, for the pure doctrine. He'll give it to you. But if we cling to apostasy, the, 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 the God's pure doctrine, we're incapable of receiving it. Right? It's very important. Ask God for the pure doctrine because he's willing to give it to you. But if you ref refuse to let go of apostasy, it will be uh, impossible for you to actually hold on to God's pure doctrine. The wine of Babylon is apostasy. It is prostitution. It's very important. It's, it started at the Garden of Eden, at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And down through the ages, it developed rebellion, disbelief, confusion, fear, pride, hatred, bitterness, resistance, anger, perversion. And it ultimately turned into something that governed the nations and governed religion. It's very important. We need to recognize this, that the only escape from Babylon is the pure doctrine of God. And how do I break free from the wine of Babylon? Luke 11.13. Luke 11.13. Here we go. Luke chapter 11, verse 13 says this. Luke eleven thirteen, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? This is how we break free from the wine of Babylon. The very first thing we need to do is ask for the Holy Spirit. We need to ask for the pure doctrine of God so that we can get to know him. John 16, 13. John 16, 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever things he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. It's the spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Christ, right? Christ is the truth, John 14, 6. And he saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The spirit of truth is the spirit of Christ. And when we have the spirit of truth, when we have the spirit of Christ, he guides us into all truth. We don't need a pastor. We don't need a Mr. Brad. We simply grab our Bibles. We say a sincere prayer to the Lord. Lord, give me of your spirit. And please, Lord, show me where I'm holding on to apostasy. Show me where I'm holding on to the wine of Babylon. Rip it from me and give me the pure truth of your word. And this is what happens. John chapter 8, verse 32. 
John chapter 8, verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's the truth of God's word that sets us free from the wine of Babylon. When I have God's pure doctrine, when the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, is leading me down the path of righteousness for his name's sake, and he's convicting my heart of sin, he's leading me to make righteous judgments, he's setting me free from the wine of Babylon. I'm free from rebellion. I'm free from disbelief. I'm free from confusion. I'm free from apostasy. I'm free from fear and pride. I'm free from anger and bitterness and resistance. I'm free from perversion and murder. Very important, very important that the truth of God's word sets us free from the wine of Babylon. Sets us free. And if any one of these, rebellion, disbelief, fear, anger, pride, selfishness, if any one of these things is still in us, that means that there's something Babylonian in us. And we all, we all have to face that. I, I have to face it. Mr. Brad, you have this Babylonian instinct. It needs to be ripped out. The Word of God needs to transform my mind. It's not, some, it's not pointing fingers at people. It's looking in the mirror and saying, Mr. Brad, why do you have this character trait, which is obviously Babylonian? You need to go to the Word of God, ask for the Holy Spirit, ask to be set free from that Babylonian character trait, so that you can walk in the newness and the, 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 the refreshing of the Spirit of Christ. Right? We need to ask God to show us the truth. Be willing to come out of Babylon. Because if we hold on to that prostitute forehead, that apostate way of thinking, we'll never come out of Babylon. And one of the important things that we need to do is not let myths and fables have strongholds in our minds that prevent Bible truth from becoming the foundation of who we are. That's very important. That's very, very important. Because in the Christian world, it's very popular for people to go to different books and say that these different books that are not part of the Bible, remember, Christ said that the laws of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms were Scripture. And the New Testament simply confirms what Christ was saying, right? So the Old Testament and the New Testament is the scripture. Christ never pointed to anything outside of the laws of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Never, not one time. If anything outside of the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms was scripture, Christ would have confirmed it to us. So the Apocrypha and books like 1st Enoch, 2nd, 3, 4, 5, 17th Enoch, these are not biblical books. I'm going, to sh I'm going to prove it right now. Very important to understand. It's the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms, which are reinforced in the New Testament. These are scripture. The, the first book of Enoch is unbiblical. Here, there's four examples why it's, it's unbiblical, and it's beyond a shadow of a doubt unbiblical. Right? First Enoch, chapter 32, verse 4. It says that it was good that the father and mother, Adam and Eve, ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. First Enoch 32.4, it was good that they sinned against God. There's no way that's inspired by the Spirit of God. No way. First Enoch 32.4 says it was good they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Impossible. That's not inspired by God. First Enoch chapter 7 verse 2 says that angels bred with humans. That's not true. The sons of God represented the tribe of Seth. The sons of men represented the tribe of Cain. Very important. The son of God in Genesis is obedient children to the word. The sons of men is disobedient children. Angels are always referred to as male in the scriptures. The scriptures say that angels do not procreate. 
angels were made from fire, humans were made from dirt. And scripture always says that each kind reproduces after its own kind. Angels do not have the capability of procreation. It's impossible. And the scripture is clear. It does not say that there are female angels. So if angels procreate, which is unbiblical, they would have to, it would be male on male procreation. And God says homosexuality is an abomination. So angels Procreating with humans is impossible because they don't have the same genetic structure. That's what the Bible says. Each kind reproduced after its own kind. Kind after kind. Kind after kind. Kind after kind. Angels don't have the capacity to reproduce with humans. That's Babylonian to say that angels and humans breed. That's that's Babylon. That's not true. That's unbiblical. There's no supporting scripture for that. And the book of Enoch specifically is going against the Bible when it says that. The book of Enoch mentions Mount Sinai. All you have to do is realize that the book of Enoch is supposedly to have been written before the flood. Mount Sinai did not exist before the flood. After the flood, the earth was terraformed. Then Mount Sinai came into existence after the flood. Impossible for Enoch to talk about Mount Sinai before the flood. It didn't exist. And this book of Enoch, is, it's not even a book. It's a compilation of different writings. It's not one author. It's dozens of authors. And it wasn't even compiled until the, in the 1820s. So to say that this is something that happened before the flood is impossible. It's impossible. And the fourth reason why the book of Enoch is not biblical in any way, because if you go to 1 Enoch chapter 74, verse 14, it says that Enoch is the Messiah. 1 Enoch 71, 14 seals the deal. Enoch is absolutely not the Messiah. No way this throw the book in the garbage the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was good that we ate it throw it in the garbage angels mixing with humans throw it in the garbage enoch is the messiah throw it in the garbage do people even actually read this book because if you read the book it's blasphemy against the word of god either you don't actually read the book of enoch or you're not reading the bible at least it, it, it's 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 babylonian it's, it's impossible now, people will say, what about Jude 14, 15? Jude 14, 15. Jude 14, 15. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, that's before the flood, prophesied of these things, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all to convince them that are ungodly among of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed and of their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken. The book of Enoch has to be that, because the book of Enoch has this quote. It does not mean anything. Does not mean anything. This does not prove that a, a compilation of paragraphs, which was compiled in 1820, is the book that Jude is referencing. It, there's no proof of that. There could have been another book, it could have been a dozen different answers. There's no proof that first Enoch, which is blasphemy, goes against scripture in dozens of different ways. There's no way that this is referring to this Enoch in Jude. It's impossible. Jesus, Jesus told us what scripture was. Jesus said that the book of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, these are they which testify of me. No way that, no way, first Enoch testifies of, not second not third, not fourth, not 17th Enoch, none of them. They don't testify of Jesus. The New Testament confirms the Old Testament, right? Giving us understanding of the transition, Old Testament pre-Messiah to New Testament post-Messiah, right? And then there's revelations and understandings for the church so that the Gentiles can be incorporated into it. That's the scriptures. Satan gives us a counterfeit word the same way he did with Eve. Satan gave Eve a counterfeit word. Satan tries to give us a counterfeit word, which seems intriguing, 
which seems desirous, right? But ultimately, it leaves us with a confused state of mind. It leaves us in a rebellious, unbelieving state of mind that goes against the word of God, right? The Apocrypha, it does the same exact thing. It gives us a Messiah whose divinity is self-gratifying and self-seeking, stretching boards that were cut wrong and making mud balls and throwing them and turning them into doves. That's not the Messiah. That's not the biblical Messiah. The biblical Messiah never, not one time, used his divinity for selfish reasons. Never, not one time. The Messiah of the Bible only relied on the strength of the Father to see him through all of life. And this mystical teaching of Babylon, which warps our understanding and is the main reason for the satanic character development is why God calls us to come out of Babylon. Revelation 18, 2 through 5. Revelation 18, 2 through 5. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquity. God is calling us to come out of Babylon. <laughs> Very important that God gives us hope that the mystical chains of Babylon can be broken. The world is steeped in Babylon, and it seems as if it's impossible to figure out what is truth, but God gives us hope. Romans chapter 4, verse 16. Romans chapter 4, verse 16 says this. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end of the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham. This is how we come out of Babylon, by the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before whom he believed. He believed, he had faith, and he believed God, who makes alive the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might come, become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. And being not weak in the faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that he had promised, he was also able to perform. And it was therefore imputed to him for righteousness. Abraham was called out of Babylon. He was called out of the land of Ur of the Chaldees. That's Babylon. That's the royalty area of Babylon. And Abraham rejected the unbelief that Babylon developed in the promises of God. Abraham focused on the promises of God. He didn't stagger at the ability of God to predict big and great things. Abraham clung to them. And Abraham was instant in obedience and submission. This is important, that Abraham's faith Abraham's belief in the promises of God and Abraham's submission to God when the word came to him is at the very heart of the gospel of Christ. This is how we come out of Babylon. The second angel's message, break the chains of Babylon. Come out of Babylon. The, the wine of the wrath of her fornication has made the whole world mad. The solution is found in Abraham. Have faith in God. 
believe God's promises, submit to God's word. If we do this, we will come out of Babylon. Very important. Have faith in God. Believe God's promises. Submit to God's word. Right? The Spirit of Christ will strengthen us when we do this. That, that's what the Bible says. Have faith in God. Believe God's promises. Submit to God's word. And the Spirit of Christ will strengthen us to overcome the character of Babylon, the character of sin, the character of rebellion, the character of disbelief, which Christ is looking to shape us and mold us back into the image of God, preparing us to be filled, preparing us to receive the Spirit, preparing us to receive the pure and good doctrine. And each angel's message is a platform for the next. The everlasting gospel and the judgment hour of God had to do with the true understanding of the Father and the Son. That it's through the Son that the kingdom is even able to exist because it's the spirit of obedience and submission that goes forth into all created beings. And when sinful humanity um, fell, Christ entered into humanity and redeemed them and then added to the Spirit victory over sin and temptation. And now anybody who chooses willfully to accept Christ as Lord and Savior and submit to the Word of God will be transformed into the image of God. That's the first angel's message. Get your life right with God through Christ. The time of the end is here. The second angel's message has to do with coming out of false doctrine, which causes a character of disbelief, rebellion, apostasy, confusion, Hatred, fear, pride, bitterness, anger, murder, very important. And that God is calling us out of Babylon, looking to reshape us back into his image. Right? God wants us to show the world that it's possible to come out of Babylon. We, we think that it's hard to come out of Babylon. God is waiting with great, God is waiting with great angst. He's anxious. For somebody to say, I am here and I am ready to fully come out of Babylon. God's going to do a mighty work in you. Those people who are sitting around saying, I don't know if it's possible. I don't know. I don't. That's unbelief. That's rebellion. That's fear. That's Babylon. God is waiting. Not only to show the world that it's possible to come out of Babylon... He's waiting to proclaim to the world that Babylon has fallen, not just from the Bible, but that Babylon has fallen from my character and is no longer a stamp on my forehead. God wants to prove that Babylon has fallen in our lives. Babylon is seductive. Don't get me wrong. Babylon will confuse us if we have loved ones that we think have gone to hell. Babylon will tell us, no, everyone goes to heaven. Babylon says, no, everyone continues to live after life. Babylon says, no, don't worry about it. The law of God no longer affects you. You're forgiven. It's seductive. Its chains are tight. And it's not stronger than Christ. We can come out of Babylon if we submit, if we believe God, if we trust in him, and we submit to his word. God will break the chains of Babylon in our life, and he will show the world that Babylon is fallen it has fallen from my forehead, right? And it's very important that those who are in, in Babylon, they're confused and they're drunk, right, with the wine of apostasy, and that God is calling people out, and we need to be gentle with them, right? God, if we trust the Spirit, he'll tell us, he'll give us the word to say in that hour. Peter was known for going around using a sword, cutting people's ears off. Jesus says that's not the way to do it. Right? We take our word, we take our sword, we take the Bible, and we share it with them lovingly, not cutting their ears off. A lot of people in Babylon, Christ is able to deliver them. Can we hear the call? Can we hear Jesus knocking at the door saying, come out of her, my people? We need to let him in. Right? There is two choices in this life, the sons of God or the sons of men. Either we're going to come out of Babylon and become the sons of God, 
or we're going to stay in Babylon and we're going to stay the sons of men. It's very important that through faith in God, through trusting God's promises, and through submission to God's word, I can be like Abraham and come out of Babylon. But if I refuse to, I'm going to maintain a spirit, a character of rebellion, of confusion. And I will never be able to stand against the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is man's authority. And if I'm not developing a strong foundation in the first angel's message, if I'm not developing a strong foundation in the second angel's message, there is no way when the third angel, angel comes and the mark of the beast comes, will I ever be able to stand? Jesus is saying, choose you this day whom you will serve. We, if for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. But a strong foundation in God's word needs to be developed, a relationship with the Son and the Father. That's eternal life. And then we need to dedicate our lives to getting to know the one true God and what he expects from us through his word. And as we dig into his word, and as we submit, he'll shape and change and mold us as his leading sees fit. Everybody's different. Not everybody's on the same page. And as this takes place, he'll prepare us to reject the mark of the beast. The time is at hand. The end is here. Come out of Babylon. Repent, therefore, and be converted. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to pray and to have a blessed Holy Sabbath. Heavenly Father, we commit our lives to you. We ask for the forgiveness of our sin. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that you would bless us with a double, triple, quadruple portion of your spirit. Give us of your pure doctrine. Rip us out of Babylon, Heavenly Father, and use us to prove to the world that Babylon has fallen from my forehead. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I love you, everybody.